So the first thing I want to invite you to think about today is what does your definition of success look like? If you're thinking about a, a three or five year horizon from where you sit right now within your council, what does success look like? How clearly can you articulate where it is you want to take your community and your people? That fear. We need to not fear the idea of stepping out and doing things differently. We need to fear that we might be sitting exactly where we are right now, 365 days on. The greatest definitions of success came from John F. Kennedy standing at Cape Canaveral. The day where he announced to the world, and certainly to the US, that the United States in the next decade was going to put a man on the moon and return him to Earth safely. Now, ambitious vision motivates you. I'd get out of bed for that. It's pretty exciting to be involved in. But the thing I like about it more comes from a little anecdote that happened a few months later when reporters visited Cape Canaveral to see how NASA's space program was progressing. And they spoke to someone in a NASA uniform in the lobby who turned out to be the cleaner of the NASA building. They didn't know that at the time. They said, sir, can you tell us what it is that you do here? And without even blinking, the cleaner said, I help put man on the moon. There was that degree of clarity within every level and every rank of the organisation that all of them knew what they were getting out of bed in the morning to do and what they were contributing towards. I think it's so important that we reflect, we might have a clear definition of success, but do our people have the same clarity? And if I went and touched base with five different people in five different parts of your organisation, would they come back to me with the same message and what your definition of success is? I think it's important that we discuss this idea of starting before we're ready. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm fortunate to get to work with organisations all around the world around transformational change. And one of the big things that we've observed doing a lot of studies with large organisations is one of the biggest barriers to actually executing change is the fact that we're holding ourselves up, waiting for a state where all the ducks line up perfectly. I describe this as, the, as waiting for ready. And I don't know if any of you have ever arrived at the town of ready, but I'm convinced it's one of these. I'm convinced it's a mirage. Now, mirages are dangerous for leaders, aren't they? Because they're this shiny thing that appears like it's not too far away. And if we just wait a couple more months, or we just wait for a bit more money in the budget, or we, we just wait till they finally appoint that full-time staff member, then we'll have the magic conditions to be able to launch the game plan. And one of the things we know is we're working in a world right now where we can't afford to wait anymore. We've got to be prepared to get out and start before we're ready, start now, put an idea into place, iterate it, change it, scale or, or drop accordingly. We've got to get used to this idea of sort of minimum viable products and getting in a space within our organisations of piloting and giving things a go at a small scale. I've seen a lot of organisations start to do innovation sprints where they think about, I always give people the, what I call the 10 buck and two week challenge. And whatever way you adapt this to your organisation, it's the idea of giving yourself the littlest bit of resourcing and the littlest bit of time to unleash the creativity of your people relative to the goals and the definition of success you've set. So setting up challenges where people get the opportunity to try and put something into place and or invent something. And then within, at the end of that duration of time, you deliberate on the results, you see what value it's added, you decide to adopt it, change it, scale it accordingly. But all of us need to be thinking about how do we actually unleash this sort of feedback loop within the environment we're working in. Resist that idea that we need to have the giant strategic plan and the first go that we have at it needs to be a $250,000 full-scale effort. And think about how do we actually start piloting these ideas at a small scale and building a culture of innovation and continuous improvement within the ranks of our teams showing that we're allowed to put ideas forward, that it's absolutely acceptable to brainstorm, there's no idea that's a stupid idea, and as well that we're actually pe prepared to put a bit of resourcing on the line to back new ideas and see if it can lead to improvements. So I challenge you in the area that you're thinking about today relative to your definition of success, to go, what, what could my sprint look like? If I was to unleash a creativity or an innovation challenge with my people, what would be my equivalent of 10 bucks in two weeks? What would I focus it on? And what would that time frame and scale look like that could allow us to start the conversation and start driving some meaningful results? This is this. How long does it take to learn from someone's lifetime of experience? Coffee. 
I remember hearing that at 19 and I went, coffee? I can do coffee. I can do a lot of coffee. <laughs> and it's that notion that learning is actually that accessible. If we're prepared to put ourselves out there, ask someone for a little bit of their time, we're capable of building the relationships that can support us, that can encourage us, energize us, and that can help us navigate the situations we're gonna find ourselves in and the roadblocks we're gonna encounter professionally. So one of the things I want you to think about is who might those people be for you? Coffee with him and he slaps this dice in the middle of the table. And I was like, okay, where, what are we doing here? He said, I want you to tell me what you can see. I looked at the dice and I said, well, I can see a six. He said, well, I can see a one. Which one of us is right? I was like, John, what are you playing at? Like, we're both right. He said, well, how can that be? I can see one thing and you're telling me you can see something completely different. I said, well, because we've got two different perspectives. He said, bingo. He said, Holly, I want you to remember three really important things as a leader. One, never assume yours is the only perspective. Two, never discount your own perspective by virtue of the fact that there are other ones. And three, we make the best decisions as a leader when we make sure as many perspectives as possible are on the table and we make our decisions in full view of them. As anyone who knows about community consultations will know, the ability to influence community conversation through powerful advocates is a very, very influential thing. So we need to be building that support network of people who back our ideas and our vision too, because people will believe so much more about what those advocates say about us and our ideas when we're not in the room than they will of what we're saying and what we're promoting ourselves. So that role of indirect influence is increasingly important in 2017. Because when we look at how trust is shifting, trust has moved away from things that had an institutional imprimatur or that had the, the traditional default authority of an institution. And it's moving back to what we know has always been powerful, word of mouth. So we as leaders need to be thinking about how we're leveraging that in person and digitally to ensure we're getting the support that we need for what it is that we're seeking to do. Real, I'd ask you all to stand up and I'd say, stay standing if you had goals. Now, I'm going to assume most people in this room are going to stay standing at that point. That's great. Question two, stay standing if your goals are written down. Probably going to lose 60% of you at that point. And yet we know there's enormous evidence of the increased rate of achievement of goals just by virtue of committing them to action in writing them down. Next question I'd say, stay standing if your goals are somewhere that you see them every day. We're probably down to about 20% of the audience at that point. The reason I talk about that is because it makes a fundamental difference between our energy management relative to what we're doing in a day. There's a big difference between the urgent and the important. But with emails and Twitter notifications and people tapping on our door and saying, hey, can I come in and have a conversation? It's really easy to get to the end of a day, let alone a week, and not have made progress relative to the things that are important. By making sure we've got our goals somewhere we can see them every day, we increase the likelihood that we're going to devote our effort and energy to what it is that's important, not just urgent. And finally, have we shared them with someone that can hold us accountable and help us achieve them? And I love this quote, you have exactly the same number of hours in a day as Pasteur and Michelangelo and Da Vinci and all these incredible people that have done wonderful things in the world. Or if I'm taking this to a 2017 context, as has been our conversation today, it'd be this, you have as many hours in the day as Beyonce. So you can minimize risk by saying, we're not gonna do all of this in one go. Here's the caveat, we're gonna start here. If we reach this goal, then we move to phase two. If we reach that goal, then we move to phase three. And there's a corresponding division of the allocation of resources. I'd argue sometimes what we've done is we've hedged all our bets too big on, and tech's a great example, one tech initiative, doesn't land in the way that we want and all of a sudden we've burnt ourselves and we don't wanna play in the game at all. We can't afford to do that, so we need to be making sure that we're continually testing and, and I guess have very clear views as to what it is that progress or success look like at every stage of that and we progress and scale up accordingly.
people. During the G20, which Virginia knows all about, uh, I was uh, leading the youth summit for the G20 and had a day where I got completely torn apart in, uh, by one of us, the senators, who was theoretically meant to be supportive and in our corner and helping us, uh, and proceeded to tell me that um, he didn't care whether we did something or nothing and nobody gave a shit about young people anyway. Uh, very flattening, and I remember calling one of my mentors and I don't know if you had this experience of not getting a reaction you're anticipating, but I was expecting it, oh, sweetie, I'm so sorry. Instead I got a, oh, first tearing apart by a senator. That earns you a Girl Scout badge. Like, what? And I was like, oh, it's progress. It's uh, not, a, not a problem, so to speak. And it was that ability to reframe and then to sit down with someone and say, okay, well, I know I can't go this strategy again because that's a dead end. How do we come up with new ways? How do I... I often find if you've got optionality, that is enough to give you confidence and, and to keep the optimism going. So how do I develop new ideas, new strategies to be able to move forward? So I'd say